Good? I just got back from the beach, so that was pretty fun. I can't complain about that. I told someone this morning, the only complaint I have is that I'm not still there. I'm just kidding. I love being here. I really, really do. We had a great time. And uh, we actually got a place that someone let us stay in for free, so that's even better. Going to the beach is pretty good, but even better whenever it costs free 99 By the way, if anyone has a condo or a beach house that they would like me to stay in and my family for free, I welcome you to share that with me anytime. <laughs> Justin, Justin seconds that he's down. <laughs> anytime, anytime you want to. I'm just, I, I just want y'all to know I'm a okay with that. All right, so uh, Acts chapter 17 is where we left off. Now it was a couple weeks ago, and before we dive into the middle of Acts chapter 17, um, this week as I was at the beach and just talking to the Lord, um, just felt in my heart to share a little bit more when it comes to. We ended last week, or we talked last, two weeks ago, sorry, about like sufferings and persecutions. And honestly, it was so awesome to see like Stephen come up here and just, dude, thank you for bearing your heart. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for being honest. Uh, it's really super encouraging, super encouraging. Um, and there were just some things, because I have this like pastoral heart that I felt like God wanted me to kind of share about that, and then we'll move on into um, Acts chapter 17. Um, because the Holy Spirit was just showing us some beautiful things uh, whenever it comes to that. The first thing is, is I really love what John read at the end. If you all, anyone stuck around, uh, for those who did stick around to the end, um, we talked about sufferings, but he read in Revelation where we have victory in Christ Jesus. That the ultimate, the ultimate end is because Jesus Christ was victorious and he reigns as king. You and I are victorious and we're reigning with Christ. That is awesome. Right? So no matter what we go through in this world, during our daily lives, we understand that we have Christ's victory. It wasn't what we did, it's what he accomplished. And by his amazing mercy and grace, we receive and we stand in what Jesus Christ has done and what he has accomplished. And at the end of it all, we stand in Jesus' victory. That's huge. That's huge. It's not about what we've done, it's about what he has done. And that brings me peace. All I do is rest and abide in what Jesus has done and believe in what Jesus has done. And no matter what we go through in this life, again, we end victorious. We are victorious and we end victorious, which is just amazing. Which is amazing to watch the things that Jesus went through, that Jesus even suffered, and that Jesus remained faithful to God. And Jesus, is said, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Like, he understood the prize was you, and the prize was me. God has always desired this deep relationship with us. So when Jesus went through his sufferings, he actually did it with joy, understanding that we were his prize. That's huge. And that's awesome. So what I want to share this morning is, actually I'll also read this too, um, what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. Was he said that he didn't consider the sufferings of this present time not worth compared. I guess you guys have been reading that or something. Not worth compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us or to us, however the translation. So whenever there are things that we go through that are difficult and they're challenging, Paul's saying, listen, they're not even worth being compared to the glory that you and I are going to receive. That's, this is super encouraging. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one being encouraged right now, but I am being incredibly encouraged. That even when the trials and things come into our lives, we can rest that Jesus has victory and we, don't even, we can't even comprehend the glory that we're going to receive. That's awesome. And that's a huge truth. But when it comes to suffering, which is our favorite topic, right? That's a great way to uh, grow a church is talk about suffering every week. I'm going to write a book about that. That's a joke. But when it comes to this, this is, these are just a few real quick points and then we'll move on that I felt like God had put on my heart. Where does suffering come from? We're talking about, and we've been reading through the book of Acts, they are being driven out, they are being stoned, they are being persecuted, they are being followed. Who's doing it? Others. This is a huge point to make. Because whenever we have um, a misunderstanding of who God is, who Daddy God is, and of His character, 
it can cause us, I mean, what we believe about God changes everything about us, the way we live, the way we interact with one another. So I really felt in my heart <laughs> the Lord saying, make sure that we, that, that we share this, that the sufferings were coming from other people. They weren't coming from Daddy God. Do you understand that? They were not coming. They were coming from other people. And God has allowed us, because of love, to have a free will. And has allowed us to do, given us choice, whatever we want to do for the most part. And because of that, it does cause suffering on people sometimes. But it's not Daddy God who's doing that, right? I thought about this this week. Some of us look around, and the, the whole topic of suffering can be difficult, right? How many people say, I don't believe in God because of the sufferings and the challenges that are going on? It happens a lot. And that's like a whole can of worms we could talk about for months and months and invite all kinds of people and speakers up here to talk about that. Um, so I'm not going to go into great details about it, but I do want to say this. Who has caused suffering on somebody else in their life? Am I the only one? Praise God. I'm glad he didn't wipe me out. I'm glad he didn't say, well, I'm done with you, John, because you just hurt somebody. I'm glad someone, you know, have you ever uh, punched someone physically? Are you glad God didn't just zap your hand off and say, I, I'm going to stop that so that you don't cause suffering on this person? Right? You ever slap your kid a little too hard? Aren't you glad God didn't rip your hand off because you did that? You understand what I'm saying? God is a gracious and a merciful God. And he's a God of love who gives us choice. In the midst of that, he doesn't go around zapping everyone who causes suffering on anybody else. And so that does cause things to come our way. But I am so thankful that God didn't end my life whenever I caused some other people misery because I was being selfish. The scriptures say that God is not, he's not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward us, not, not wishing that any should perish. God is, is so patient, so caring, so merciful, so gracious. He allows us to make mistakes. And sometimes it does hurt other people, but it's not God doing it. And praise God, he's not zapping me dead every time I make a mistake or cause suffering on somebody else. Right? That's huge. And that's a really, really, really important part. Because we don't even know the people. Sometimes people that are causing suffering may be causing suffering to people now, but giving life later on when they recognize who God is, when they recognize who they're called to be when they recognize their worth. I mean, shoot, I didn't know what my worth was when I was a teenager. I wasn't following Jesus. I heard some things about it, but I didn't know how valuable I was in his sight. When I understood the value that I had, when I understood how valuable he is, more importantly, then everything began to flip and everything began to change. And though it did, it did take some time, but now I believe I've been growing and growing and will continue to grow into Jesus' image where I'm looking and caring about others and not just myself. And so where I was causing a lot of suffering, I can say I'm, I'm bringing a lot of life now. And I want to continue to bring more and more and more and more life to other people. And again, that's why I said some, of these, some folks that will cause suffering now will bring life later on. Isn't it awesome that God's patient with us? I mean, Jesus told a parable of the wheat and the tares, did he not? He said... Someone went and he sowed wheat. And then an enemy came in and sowed tares, which is weeds. And the farmhands, they came and they said, we should rip up all these, these tares, these weeds, right? And he's like, no, be patient. Wait until the end. Wait until we see when they grow into maturity what they truly are because you might accidentally rip up the good with the bad. Wait and be patient. And then at the end, you can take all the weeds and you can get rid of them and you can grab and you can harvest the wheat. Be patient. Some of the people, and we all are those people, right? Who may have caused these things on people, sufferings and whatever. We've seen the awesomeness of God. That's huge. So it's not God's who, God who causes suffering. Paul and Silas and Timothy are not being punished by God. or they're not being, they're not, God is not saying, this is a good thing, so I'm going to make these people stone you. That's a misunderstanding of who God is. It's, again, God in our free will and these guys are coming, and they're coming against him. And guess what? Some of them are probably going to come to know the Lord eventually, which is just awesome. Praise Jesus! But can God produce good things through sufferings? Yeah. God always does good things and can produce good things. And that's the second point that the Lord was sharing with me. Um, I'll read Hebrews chapter 5 real quick. 
This is pretty, and I mentioned this last week, but I want to go into slightly a little bit more detail. It says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. That's deep. That's deep. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So what the scripture is saying is that Jesus learned more and more what obedience to God was through these sufferings that were coming against him. What were the sufferings coming against Jesus? Other people. People who were persecuting him uh, for, for what he was teaching, the Pharisees who were getting mad at him for his teachings and all these things. And ultimately, he suffered to the point of death from humanity crying, kill him. But through this whole process, it wasn't God doing it. God wasn't saying, I'm going to make these Pharisees badmouth you and do all these things. It was their choice to do that. And as that was taking place, though, Jesus was learning more and more what it looks like to obey God. Despite these circumstances that were all around him. He actually grew in it. It says he learned obedience through what he suffered, so that means he had to have grown in it. It wasn't that he was disobedient, and then now he learned how to be obedient. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying Jesus was disobedient and sinned and all this stuff, and then he learned obedience. It was he, whenever the circumstance came up, he learned how to trust God and trust in him whenever someone called him a name or whatever. Then he learned how to trust in God when someone came against his, the ministry that he was doing. He learned to trust in God whenever they begin to physically hurt them. He learned to trust in God whenever they begin to spit and mock on him, mock at him. He learned to trust in God when they drove nails through his hands. He began to trust in God to the point of where he is dying. And as he dies, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He understood with, with the source was from. He said, they just don't understand. That's the point. And if Jesus had not grown in that, had not learned all this, then he could have been on the cross going, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. This is so horrible what's happening. But he learned how to love. He learned, he learned what it meant in all these circumstances. Again, he was never disobedient. But as he these circumstances came, he showed that he could remain obedient. Same way, listen, it's so easy for us to say, man, I love God and I love people. We talked about this, Jay, remember that little conversation? I love God and I love people. It's a lot easier, it's really easy to say that, but sometimes it's very difficult to live that out, especially whenever challenging circumstances come against you in your life. Imagine you making a mistake at work and someone just doesn't really like you. So they start telling everyone about your mistake that you made just to belittle you and make you look bad. You ever had that happen before? I think a lot of us probably had. Maybe that person's kind of looking for a promotion. Maybe they're you know, trying to look good in front of their manager, so, and you're, pretty, you're a really good worker, so they want to kind of belittle you a little bit. It's, a lot, it's really easy to say, I love people. Oh, I love people like Jesus does. And then that happens, and now you are faced with a circumstance. What are you going to do with that? You can do one of two things. You can grow and learn how to love that person, despite what's taking place, or you can grow in bitterness and anger and resentment and, bitter, and, and be bitter and allow that to just destroy you and your family and your life and be all angry about it. Or you can say, you know what? Not in a um, I'm so holy way and whatever, but you know what? This person doesn't, they must not understand the value of who they are in God and who I am in God and understand the call for us to be in community and love one another, and to, and to lift each other up, to, to serve one another, to care for one another. They, must just, they just don't quite understand that. I, so I just love them so much, and I'm going to show them what that looks like. And I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to show them what it looks like. And the next time that happens, it may be a little easier for you to say, I choose to love that person. Right? That's a suffering. That's something that has come against you. But in the midst of that, you're growing in the Lord. And then your spouse cheats on you. Then you really get to learn what it's like to love people. That's a hard one. And then you get, then you get the opportunity. Will I grow in my love 
will I learn to trust as Jesus did the Father despite my circumstances? And then while that's taking place, if you continue to choose love, you continue to be ever, ever, ever liberated. And you continue to not be driven by your circumstances and what's taking place. Instead, you choose to love no matter what. That's just one example. You grow in endurance. You grow in patience, all kinds of things. I got a chance to grow in patience this week, spend a whole week with my kids. I love my boys. And honestly, they were pretty darn good. It's just kids are uh, demanding sometimes, right? When you <laughs> have three boys that are under 10, it's, there's a lot going on. And I remember a couple times my patience was running thin, and that the Lord was just kind of showing me they're just being boys. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I said, Lord, just help me. I want to grow in this patience. I really do. And it was, all, it was actually really, really good. Um, but again, through whatever takes place, we can grow in these things. So much so that look at the attitude that Paul and the disciples had in the midst of sufferings, just like Jesus. Jesus, it said, for the joy that was set before him. But Paul and these guys are rejoicing whenever these things come against them. Re- they have found the liberation of loving people, loving God, trusting in Jesus, trusting in his kingdom, trusting in his faithfulness, and being completely liberated to the point to where people are beating them and hurting them and all kinds of things. And they're like, whoa, this is awesome that we could suffer this for King Jesus. I wrote down, I, I wrote down just a few little things that, that, that Paul said that's just absolutely amazing. It says in Colossians 1.24, I'm now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. Isn't that crazy? Like he understood that it was for their benefit, so he welcomed it because he was operating in love, which love puts other people's needs in front of you. In and, 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 and Philippians, and then I'll be done with this part here, in Philippians, the imprisoned Paul says, some proclaim Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for defense of the gospel, others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering. So some people are proclaiming Christ in love. Other people are doing it to make Paul suffer even more. And he says, what does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way. Whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. He had come to the point to say, even if people are trying to increase my suffering, I'm not really worried about myself, I'm worried about King Jesus. And if he's being glorified, hallelujah, praise God. That's awesome. That is awesome. It's amazing. Oh, one more thing about what suffering is not, and I want to say this because I've heard this a lot. Um, someone say something along the lines of, God gave me this cancer to teach me something. Um, I like to interpret Scripture by Scripture, and I don't see an example in here where God puts a sickness on someone for a blessing to benefit them. Now, sickness comes through a variety of ways, whether it's our fallen world or the enemy or whatever it may be. But Daddy God is not putting a sickness on you so that you can learn something. Can God teach you something in the midst of a sickness? Sure. He can turn all things good. He can teach you things. No doubt about it. I know people that have gone through very difficult sicknesses and and they grew closer to God. I get it. But daddy is not saying I'm going to put cancer on you so that I can, so you can learn something. And I just want to make that very, very clear. Um, Because again, I don't see ever in scripture, ever once God blessing someone with a sickness. Not one time. And I want to point that out again these sufferings that we're reading about Paul and all these people that that Jesus that goes through are coming from other people they're not coming from daddy God and that's huge that's huge if y'all want to look in Acts chapter 17 um, I know that's kind of some heavy stuff but it's so liberating whenever we begin to really own that in Acts chapter 17 um, we're going to step into now Actually, I'll read what we left off with last week because it kind of goes along these lines real quick. Um, Let's let's, uh, read chapter 17, verse 13. Yeah. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea as well, they came there too to stir up and incite the crowds. Can you put that map up, Joey? While I read this. Then the believers immediately sent Paul away to the coast, but Silas and Timothy remained behind. Those who conducted Paul 
brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions to have Silas and Timothy join him as soon as possible, they left him. So what we see here again is, is Paul going, and he, they're preaching in Thessalonica, and they're, and they're preaching in Berea, as we've been talking about here. And then they actually are having folks, like these are the challenges that Paul had. We're talking about something like people are actually coming from Thessalonica just to harass him in Berea. Can you imagine that? And Paul continues to speak the word of God with joy, despite these things that took place. You know, I actually believe, by the way, this was Paul's thorn in his side. Again, I like to interpret Scripture by Scripture, and every mention in the Old Testament about a thorn in the side is about Israel not taking some people out or something, and it said that they were a thorn to their side. I believe that's what it was. Um, that's, just, that's my personal take on that, is that God, Paul had asked at some point in time, God, I'm tired of this, that this is a lot of people coming against me, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. But he continued to do this no matter where they went, and now we see that Paul shows up in Athens. Now, this is an amazing section of Scripture. This is an amazing section because what we get to see here, guys, is we've seen Paul go in and, and, and proclaim the kingdom to Jews and their synagogue and, and all this stuff. We really get a really good picture of what it looked like when Paul was sharing the kingdom of God with Gentiles, with Greeks. And it's awesome. Like, I get so excited whenever I read this because if you all don't know me, like, I love to share Jesus with people. And I want everyone to know Jesus because Jesus is awesome. And Jesus absolutely transformed my life. He continues to transform my life. And there's no better life than life in Jesus. And I'm just being real. I've, I've been in this life for like 16 years now. And I'm so not going back. It is amazing. I have to tell everybody because it's phenomenal. It's so good. So when I get to see Paul and how he was able to share the kingdom, I'm like taking notes because I'm so excited about the way he was sharing the kingdom. And I think that we can learn some really amazing things from this. I really do. As, we're, as we approach folks at our workplace and, and folks at the pool hall and folks at the bowling alley and, and wherever we are, in the communities that we have, wherever we're at, that we have some awesome, awesome things that we can pull out of here and learn from Paul as he was going to the Athenians. So in verse 16, Paul's in Athens, and it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So we see that Paul arrives in Athens here, and he notices that there's idols everywhere. And you know what's amazing? Like, it bothers Paul. <laughs> like, he has been so liberated by the gospel. He has been so liberated by Jesus that, like, when he sees people being deceived by these idols, like, he's got to do something about it. It bothers him. He's like, oh, I've got to do something about it here. Because again, what we believe about God changes everything. And so it says that he goes to the synagogue as he normally does. And then it also mentions here that he goes to the marketplace. So really, Paul is now going to, uh, not only to the synagogues, but to the place where there's a lot of people going to be, right? And what does it say? And also in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So Paul was absolutely going to the place where there were people at, that he knew they were going to be there, and whoever would talk to him, Paul was going to be telling them about Jesus and the resurrection. I love to look at Paul's life. It's so encouraging because I'm like, man, I want to be that like dead to self where I just don't care, and I just want to you know, share Jesus with all these people and love people that much is the real truth. And we see that. We get to see that Paul has this heart of Papa God, this Daddy God heart that looks and sees a bunch of people that are being deceived and says, I've got to do something about that. I'm going to reveal my true self, who I am to these people. And it says here, as he is in the marketplace, it says some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some says, what does this babbler want to say? I bet that was nice to hear, huh? How would you like to be sharing Jesus to people and people are like, what is this babbler saying? It kind of gives you insight into the stuff Paul was dealing with, and he continued again to trust in God. Others says he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign deities. This was because 
He was telling the good news, the good news, yay, about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know this new teaching, it may know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. So first they call Paul a babbler, but he meets these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but this were like two of the major schools of thought in Greek culture, right? Like this was like, this was like huge. I mean, Epicureans and the Stoics and what they believed, this was a huge piece and foundation to what the Greek culture believed. And I could go into some more detail, but Ben Austin would be great about talking about that kind of stuff with. And I don't want to butcher it in front of him, so I'll just be very simple. It's the way I like to do things. But just, just a couple things real quick about what they believed. And, and I want to point out a few, just a few things that Paul is going to address as he addresses the folks here. Uh, one is Epicureans believe that the gods were very far away, that they didn't m- meddle in um, human affairs. To be honest, some basically looked almost as if they were atheists, where they really didn't really have, they didn't do anything here. They were very materialistic in what they believed. Uh, and also they believed in things like just enjoying the simple pleasures of life and learning to, to find the joy in those. Uh, not to pursue things like power and all this kind of stuff because that'll just distort the joy of the, sense, the shelter and food and very simple things in life. But again, the gods are far away. They want nothing to do with you. Uh, Stoics, on the other hand, they believe that, that the divinity was within the universe and within all of us. And we could tap into that divinity, though that divinity wasn't really personal. So in none of these situations was there any kind of real personal God. And then based on these things, Stoics and Epicureans actually had some similarities in in, uh, some of the stuff they believed in their ethics and different things like that and and, and dissimilarities. But just that just some very basic stuff for what Paul was uh, coming into, the situation that he was coming into here. And now he was said, these people are saying, now we want to hear what you're going to say. So what's Paul going to do? What would you do? Like he goes in this situation, he sees that these people are... that they're that 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 they're 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 following these different philosophies, that they're following idols, that there's a lot of different things that are kind of clashing here, and now they're saying, you know, you're preaching about this Jesus and resurrection. We haven't heard about this. Paul, share this with us. And it's cool because we get to really see again the way Paul approaches this. And I think it's different than the way many of us have approached sharing our faith sometimes. And for me, it, it, it's, just, it's, it's just wonderful to read. It says, Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. So what happens is, is Paul is actually, because he's disturbed, about what's going on, he's walk, and he's walking through the city. I can imagine Paul, it doesn't say exactly what was going on, but I can imagine Paul talking to God, saying, God, I want these people to know you. Show me. Show me where you've revealed yourself to these people. Show me where I can, uh, a starting point to where I can share with them Jesus Christ. Papa, let me, Daddy, let me know your heart for these people. I can just imagine him going through the city and, and, and praying over the city and walking through the city and spending time in the city understanding what these people believe. And then all of a sudden he stumbles upon this altar that says to an unknown God, and God goes, bing! And so Paul starts off not belittling these people. Did you notice that? He doesn't start off going, you guys stink. All that you believe is garbage. And I'm right, and you're all wrong. At all. What you believe is stupid. See, this is what our society teaches us. That if people don't believe what you believe, they're ignorant and they're stupid. And that you should belittle them. (laughs) Have you turned on the TV? Right? Uh, Paul doesn't, at least one or two people thought that was funny, but I mean, it's just a reality of thing. Paul doesn't start there. Paul actually says, look, I see that you're religious in every way. He starts from a point of revelation. And this is something that Paul does continually. Because Paul understands that God is revealing himself 
to men and women and kids from every tribe and language and people and nation all over the world. He is absolutely revealing. This is a huge part of understanding God's heart and His desire for us. Is He understood that God is revealing Himself to people. And He's not going to ignore that. He's not going to ignore the revelation that God has already given to people or belittle that revelation because maybe it's not as full as what He's received. Instead, He's going to take them from point of revelation to an even greater revelation to an even greater revelation. He's also not going to, uh, as we're going to see here, hide who God is or who Jesus is and be fearful of it. But again, he starts with the point of revelation. Like, imagine having a conversation with somebody. And have you ever done this? I think I was talking to Brandon about this. Like, I thought of this example. Like, anyone ever tell you, like, they're a spiritual person? You ever make fun of them for that? I have. Back in the day, I wasn't too nice sometimes. Um, like, I thought it was, I was like, what does that mean? What do you mean you're spiritual? Do you pray? You know, uh, who are you praying to? You know, and just kind of like sitting on my high horse because I knew what was right, and they didn't, they obviously didn't. Anybody done that besides me? I sure have. What if I approached it and I thought, how has God revealed himself to this person? And whenever they said that, I began to say, that's awesome. You ever talk to God? Do you? Have you? Well, yeah, you know, I do sometimes. That's awesome. You know God wants to talk to you? You know that he's personal and that he loves you and that he cares for you? You know, I talk to God all the time. And then so forth and so on. Jesus revealed who God was. He's a personal God. He loves you. What a different approach than belittling and saying, you're wrong, I'm right. It changes the ball game. Ask Justin, ask John King, when they, you go into cultures with people of other religions, they're looking for what people call gospel bridges. They're looking for how has God revealed himself to these people. They don't come in going, we have it all right and you have it all wrong. They say, God is a God who reveals himself to people. Now, it doesn't mean that they affirm everything that people believe. And that's not, Paul's not going to do that here at all. But he is going to say, where is God revealing himself? Where has he revealed himself in this culture to these people? And then from that point, we'll just, let's just read what he says. Okay, to an unknown God. Well, therefore, you worship as unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live, excuse me, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all gives, excuse me, gives to all mortal life and breath and all these things. So, so Paul, Paul first addresses, and we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit on, that he's saying, listen, if God is God, how can he dwell in places made by human hands? He's addressing the idols and the different things that he sees around the city. He's doing it, he's doing it in a spirit of love. He's saying, listen, I see that you're religious, but think about this, guys. How can this be God but yet you're making God his dwelling. If he's God, of course he can't be served by, by human hands. As though he needs anything. And it says, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. And the Stokes would have probably said, huh, yes he does. Yes, the divinity does give life to breath, to mortals and breath and all these things. From one ancestor he made all the nations to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted the times and uh, of their existence and the boundaries of their places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said for we too are his offspring so Paul's addressing some of the Epicurean and Stoic school of thought right here he's saying listen listen Um, From one ancestor, God made all the earth, and that God has really been revealing himself, that, 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 that people would search and that they would actually find out who God genuinely is. God is personal. He has personality. He's not this God that you're ever groping for, that you can't find who, who he is, or he's not some kind of a divine substance where you can never know. He's saying, no, you absolutely can, and God has been revealing himself that way. And then... He quotes one of the Stoic philosophers of the day. 
And whenever he does that, he literally is quoting them. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And this is Aretas who said this. In him we live and move and have our being, as some of them have, your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. That is a very interesting statement that Paul makes. That would be, this is a, a, a Greek, you know, philosophy in school thought that has all kinds of untruths about God in it. it just, just to be real. But yet, he goes to this point of revelation that God has revealed to them, and he begins to expound upon that. He doesn't crush them. He doesn't crush them. He quotes them. That would be like me talking to someone um, that's Islamic and quoting the Quran. Half the church may be like, dude, I'm out of here with this guy. Why is he quoting that? You don't think God reveals himself to Muslims? You don't think God reveals himself to Buddhists? You don't think God, do you think that he doesn't do that? Again, I'm not here to say affirming all that their beliefs, because if we, because then it gets all messed up. What I am saying is taking them from revelation to revelation and seeing how God has revealed himself. And that's exactly what Paul does here. That's exactly what Paul does here. It's amazing what he says there. Since we are God's offspring, so he begins to affirm that revelation that God has made. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or imagination of mortals. He affirms that position, but then goes on to say, but let me give you a, a more a real revelation of who God really is, though. And he actually denies this idea that God is an idol and that he can be made with human hands again. Do you understand what I'm saying here? While God overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Like now he's going in, now he's getting deep. And now he's not afraid. He's not afraid. He's loving people enough to recognize how daddy God has revealed himself to them. And then he's taken them into further revelation of who God is and now calling them to action. Because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness or justice by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. See, Epicureans in particular would have never believed in a resurrection of the dead. They scoffed. They laughed at him. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So Paul goes, and again, he affirms the truth of who God is, but then he's not afraid to reveal, to give more revelation about who God is, and even, again, call them, say, you have to have metanoia, you have to change your, he's inviting them to change their mind about who God is. And metanoia is, again, we've talked about that, it's deeper than just me saying I'm changing my mind. It's really more like a heart change. It is a heart change. It is a walking away. He's calling them to leave their idols. That's what he's saying. He's calling them to say, I'm revealing who God truly is. He is not this. He's not these idols or whatever. I'm calling you to turn away from these things and to turn to the living and the true God. Because God is coming through Jesus to set everything right. He's he's going to judge the world in righteousness. God's judgment is a good thing. He is going to set everything right. All these wrongs that we look around the world and go, oh man, this stinks that this has to happen and this has to happen. God is setting it all right through Jesus and he's doing it now and will finally do it at the end of time when we dwell in his kingdom forever. And he finally, when he separates the wheat from the tares and does all that, sets everything right. And we live in peace and we live in joy And we live in daddy's arms for eternity. Man, I'm about to get excited. And all the the challenges and the pains and the sufferings when in 10,000 years of just being in God's pure bliss, uh, we just kind of we'll forget about it or we won't think about it too much anymore. Just amazing. And Paul is inviting them to know this God who's going to set everything right. It's all done through Jesus Christ. And in this, guys, I just, see, I just see the love of God for people and the recognition that our God cares about all people. 
and that he's revealing his nature and who he is to all people and that he's using, inviting people like you and me to show people a more clear revelation of who God is and then invite them to join. Invite them to decide to follow Jesus. Invite them into relationship with this God. Invite them to trust in this God. And again, this approach for me is liberating. It's liberating because it's not about me trying to argue about how I'm right and how you're wrong and fighting with you. It's totally different. It's me loving and caring for you, not being afraid to reveal the truth of who God is to you, but not belittling you and being angry with you and fighting with you. You understand what I'm saying? It's good. This is good stuff. Father, we love you. We're amazed at your love for this world. Jesus, we're amazed at what you've done so that everything can be set right. Like, we're, we're floored. We stand in awe of you. We worship you now, Jesus. You guys just want to worship Jesus, just whisper to him or shout to him, whatever you, whatever you want, just of his goodness. We worship you in this place, Jesus. You are our King. You are our Lord. You have loved us with an everlasting love. And you have endured suffering in joy because we're your prize. And you are setting this world right. And you will ultimately set everything right. And then you've invited us to participate in your victory. All we can do is just step back and say thank you. And for eternity, thank you and love on you for all that you've done and bought for us, God. Father, I pray right now that, that, that we would learn from your word this morning, that we would receive your wisdom for how to share this amazing news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom with this world. Father, I pray that we would have our hearts knitted with yours and that we would see the value that you have on every person in this world. And we would see that you are revealing yourself. Holy Spirit, you are revealing yourself to these people. And I pray right now for just absolute understanding, Lord, for supernatural understanding of how you're revealing yourself, Lord. To people, that, 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 that Lord, that we would begin to see it more clearly than we've ever seen it. Maybe that's the best way to say it, God. That we would have our hearts so knitted with yours that we would actually, as we go places and we come in contact with folks, that we would literally, we would see very quickly how you're revealing yourself. And that we would allow you to change their hearts. And that we would partner with you and how you're changing their hearts that we wouldn't force, but we would allow you to have your will, that we wouldn't shy away, but again, allow you to have your will, God. Because we want to see our cities and our communities absolutely transformed for your kingdom. And you want it even more than we do. We just say we're here for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, if you, um, I felt in my heart, if, if, if there may be some people here that are just saying, you know, I'm so excited about Jesus and I want people to know him, but I don't really know what to do. I don't know that was just in my heart. I don't really know what to do. Come talk to me. I want to not only pray with you, but connect you with people, connect you with me, and I'll wa- I want to walk. Like, seriously, if you're like, I want to see people change for the kingdom, but I just don't know what to do, come see me. That's what we're about. That's what we're about in this community. Love you guys.